Hello, welcome to DSCapades, the only show on the internet dedicated to covering rare and obscure Nintendo DS games. We have a very special episode for you today, and I'm going to start this episode off with a DSCapades fun fact. Did you know there is not one, not two, but three Nintendo DS games that feature Brendan Fraser on the cover? We have The Mummy, Tomb of the Dragon Emperor, Journey to the Center of the Earth, and Inkheart. I know some of you are thinking to yourself, so what? Brendan Fraser's on the cover of 3DS games. Big deal. Daniel Radcliffe, he's on the cover of 5DS games. Why don't you make a video about him? There are 5DS games with Daniel Radcliffe on the cover, but you may have noticed they are all Harry Potter games. And you know, Daniel Radcliffe, he's not even on the cover of all the Harry Potter games that came out on the Nintendo DS. He's not on either of the LEGO Harry Potter DS games, nor is he on Hagrid's Downhill Jam. He's not even on Touch My Frog featuring Neville Longbottom. Look, I could list off fictional Harry Potter games that Daniel Radcliffe is not on the cover of all day. Nintendobbies. My point is, Brendan Fraser is on the cover of three different DS games, based on three different movies, developed by three different developers, and published by three different publishers. There's no way around it. Three Brendan Fraser DS games is too many Brendan Fraser DS games. It would be completely unremarkable if Brendan Fraser was on the cover of, say, a single DS game. There's quite a few well-known actors that have been on DS games that are based on movies they've starred in. Christopher Walken is on the cover of Balls of Fury. Jack Black is on Nacho Libre. And look who it is, world's greatest actor by volume, not quality, Nicolas Cage is on the cover of Disney's Sorcerer's Apprentice. Hey Nicolas Cage, what's your favorite Nintendo handheld system? DS! Oh, cool. Well, what's your favorite PlayStation system? DS! Though it's not uncommon for celebrities to grace the cover of the occasional DS game, it! you can definitely make the case that these three actors, who are only on the cover of a single DS game, are really on a level above Brennan Fraser when it comes to their acting careers. They're just bigger names. If you go over to Bing, yes, Bing.com, it's actually useful, I had no idea, you can compare public figures, and well, Brendan Fraser really doesn't measure up to the rest of these guys. Christopher Walken, Jack Black, and Nicolas Cage all have a larger net worth and have been in more feature films than Brendan Fraser. They've also won and been nominated for more awards than Brendan Fraser. Nicolas Cage has been married four times, more than the three other guys combined, but Brendan Fraser does lead the pack in a few categories. He has the most children and is the tallest, which I actually knew because his IMDB page lists towering height as his trademark feature. Yeah, that's how I describe Brendan Fraser to people who are unfamiliar with him. Yeah, you know Brendan Fraser. He's, uh, he's in the Mummy movies, he's like big in the 90s, he's kinda handsome, he's f***ing towering, he's a lighthouse of a man. I, personally, have seen him on multiple occasions punch a Gundam in the damn throat. <laughs> that's his real trademark, is just throwing haymakers at mechs, just all right, back to these games based on these movies. You know, this one, Inkheart, I had never heard of. I had to look it up, and it's a movie from 2008. And actually, all three of these games are based off of movies that were made in 2008. Well, that would explain why Brendan Fraser has the same dumb center part haircut on the cover of all three games. And no offense to Brendan Fraser, but I'm pretty sure even he would admit that 2008 was not exactly the height of Brendan Fraser mania. Here's a graph I made that represents Brendan Fraser's popularity over time. He had his first major role in the 1992 comedy movie Encino Man, but it wasn't until 1997 that he had his first major box office success with Disney's George of the Jungle. Brendan Fraser reached the peak of his career in 1999 with the box office behemoth The Mummy, which together with its 2001 sequel, The Mummy Returns, earned a combined $850 million. Most importantly, it gave the world his first Brendan Fraser video game. After doing a few lackluster movies at the turn of the century, Brendan Fraser's popularity started to wane, 
The last movie he did during this period was Looney Tunes Back in Action, which did have a movie tie-in game which was released across three platforms. But sadly, Brendan Fraser was completely absent from the video game's cover. He had a supporting role in the Oscar-winning drama Crash in 2004, but other than that, significant acting jobs were few and far between during the mid-2000s, until 2008 when he starred in these three movies, which spawned these three DS games, which spawned this DSCapades video. Brendan Fraser's career really bottomed out in 2010 when he starred in the widely panned comedy Furry Vengeance, which received a 7% score on Rotten Tomatoes. But, you know, critics aren't the end-all be-all, so just watch this clip and decide for yourself. Shortly after filming for Vengeance, Brendan Fraser attended the 2010 Golden Globe Awards, and for whatever reason, he just clapped really weird. And that was pretty much it. That was the end of his career in movies. Hollywood's tough. You can't, can't make bad movies. You can't clap weird. Or you won't be in movies. Well, I was going to play these games, but I spent so much time researching Brendan Fraser's career, I could probably just end the episode right here. I mean, come on. Do I have to play these games? I mean... They look really dumb. Our first Brendan Fraser game is The Mummy, Tomb of the Dragon Emperor, which is based on the third movie in the Mummy trilogy. Unlike the first two Mummy movies, which were set in Egypt, Mummy 3 takes place in China and has Brendan Fraser face off against a crazed ancient warlord played by certified cool guy Jet Li. And if you're wondering if the Terracotta Warriors make an appearance, they do, and they become reanimated and cause quite the kerfuffle. You can't take these dudes anywhere. A Mummy 3 video game was released across three platforms. The PS2 and Wii version were developed by UK-based Eurocom, while the DS version was developed by Canadian studio Artificial Mind and Movement, who are no stranger to making movie tie-in games on the Nintendo DS, as they made all of these titles. I don't know about you, but I am ready to play some high-quality Brendan Fraser shovelware. Here's The Mummy, Tomb of the Dragon Emperor. The game starts out with one of the absolute worst opening movies I've ever seen in a video game. I can't really even call it a movie because it lasts for a minute and a half and consists of just three still images. Long ago, in a time of darkness, China suffered the rule of a ruthless emperor. The Emperor's mystics taught him mastery of the five elements, fire, water, earth, wood. As much as I appreciate that they actually have voice acting in this game, it is pretty terrible. Zizhuan was made to perform the ritual, but she changed the incantation and cursed the ruthless Emperor and all who shed blood in his name. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's just some drunk lady they found at the casino playing slot machines at 10 in the morning. The first level has you explore an ancient Chinese tomb, where you avoid some booby traps and move some statues. There's more voice acting, and it's definitely not Brendan Fraser. Now, unfortunately, he's not the dead guy who's going to make me famous. I have to keep moving. I actually looked at the credits. It's not him. I can't do that here. This guy loves to talk to himself. All of the terracotta warriors seem to be guarding the feng shui compass. Some of the puzzles utilize the DS's touchscreen. It's nothing groundbreaking, but it works fine and is used just enough to mix up the gameplay a bit. That being said, 99% of the game takes place in the top screen. The bottom screen is mainly used as a menu. You have your green health bar on top, you can see how many shotgun shells you have left, and this suspicious yellow liquid on the left here is actually adrenaline, not urine. You use a shotgun to fend off enemies, but they run super fast, and whenever there are multiple enemies, it just devolves into me running away in a circle. Within the first five minutes, this game makes repeated references to the five Chinese elements. I locked him in using the five Chinese elements. Water, earth, metal, wood, and fire. You know, in school I was taught there was actually ten Chinese elements. Let's see if I can remember. There's, uh, water, earth, metal, 
wood, dirt, yogurt, poison, leaves, denim, jazz, and gravy. Yep, that's it. Those are the ten. Oh, there's just a random horse here hanging around with these terracotta warriors. I guess he's there for moral support. I, I, I think he's their therapist. This game isn't too bad. It's a little rough around the edges, which isn't uncommon for movie tie-in games that were made on a strict timeline. Thankfully, by 2008, most Nintendo DS developers knew how to get the most out of the not-so-powerful system, and that's apparent with this game's 3D levels. They honestly look pretty good. I like the detail they put into the ancient tomb, the spiderwebs on the wall, these artsy Chinese doors, this bitchin' sarcophagus, and I especially like how they have Jet Li's character on the wall here. Very ominous. Although the levels look pretty good, the characters are pretty bland. The enemies all look very similar, if not exactly the same. There is very little detail put into the main character's 3D model. You can barely tell it's Brendan Fraser. In fact, in the first level, you see Jet Li's face more than Brendan Fraser's face. I still have two more Brendan Fraser games left to play, so I should really wrap this up. The game makes a really bad first impression with its awful intro, but ends up being a perfectly playable, if not unpolished, adventure game. I give this game 6 awkward claps out of 10. Next is Inkheart. Unlike The Mummy, Tomb of the Dragon Emperor, which was released across multiple platforms, Inkheart is a true Nintendo DS exclusive. The Inkheart DS game was adapted from the movie, which itself was an adaptation of the fantasy novel, written by German author Cornelia Funke. Funke insisted that Brendan Fraser be cast in the film's lead role. She even wrote Brendan Fraser a letter, personally asking him to be in the movie, saying that she envisioned him as the role of Mo Fulchert when she was writing the book. The general plot to the Inkheart book, movie, and DS game is that Brendan Fraser's character has the ability to bring storybook characters to life just by reading the words off the page. But Brendan Fraser's character is kind of an idiot, and he accidentally summons an evil villain from a rare antique book called Inkheart while inadvertently sending his wife to the book world. Brendan Fraser and his teenage daughter Maggie embark on a journey to find a copy of the rare book so that they can reunite their family and banish the evil villain back to the Ink world. The movie wasn't nearly as successful as the novel, taking in only 7.5 million its opening weekend, going on to be the 125th highest grossing movie the year it came out. Its lackluster performance at the box office certainly didn't warrant a video game adaptation, but they probably didn't expect the movie to be such a dud when they decided to make a movie tie-in game. So here we are. Embracing the literary theme of the movie, this game is played on its side and read like a book. Totally original. No other game has ever done this before! The game is a point and click, or rather, a point and touch, since you use the stylus on the bottom touch screen to interact with your surroundings. As you might expect, there's quite a lot of reading in this game, so I'd also consider it to be in the visual novel genre as well. I'm just gonna come right out and say it this game is very boring. A total snooze fest. The game is completely driven by its story but the plot doesn't even get remotely interesting until you find out Brennan Fraser has these magical book powers, which for me was about an hour into the game. For reference, Brennan Fraser's magical powers have been explained and you see him bring things from the book into real life in the movie's first two minutes. This game is up there with Dragon Quest VII for games that start out with a tedious amount of reading before any real action happens. The only genuinely enjoyable moment I experienced in the game's first hour was this toboggan racing minigame. It was a bit challenging, but surprisingly fun. I had hopes that all the minigames would be as fun as this one, but the next minigame I played was this completely irrelevant juggling minigame. Well, that's disappointing. Look, if I wanted to play a juggling game on the DS, I'd play this Japanese game called Juggler DS. What is this? What does this mean? What, this is seriously a game? Junky Juggler. Lovely Juggler A. I'm Juggler 7. I'm Juggler EX. 
All right, sorry, I'm getting way off topic. Inkheart, Inkheart. This game is so boring, I want to talk about weird Japanese games, but I gotta stick to the Brendan Fraser games. The Inkheart DS game plays just fine. It's not glitchy or anything. The controls are good. It's definitely more polished than the last game we played, which is to be expected considering it's just sprites moving across a 2D background. The background illustrations are nice, but the sprites in the game are a bit goofy. I don't know, they're just... Something seems off, like check out this walk cycle. What is this, Lester the Unlikely? The illustrations of the characters on the left screen are good, and they're accurate to the movie's characters. You can see it really looks like Brendan Fraser. It's unfortunate that each character only has one unchanging illustration here the entire game though. In text-heavy games that focus on story, it helps to have a handful of images of each character making different facial expressions to go along with the dialogue. I mean, how hard would it be to make an illustration of sad Brennan Fraser, or an angry Brennan Fraser, or a mischievous Brennan Fraser? The answer is not very hard. I photoshopped this in like two minutes. Overall, this game is digital molasses. It moves slower than pond water, and as far as point and clicks go, feels pretty dated. I could see this game being a lot more popular if it was a PC game from 1996 instead of a DS game from 2009. It might seem like an unfair comparison, but because it's a dialogue-heavy point-and-click that you play on a sideways DS, I feel the need to compare it to Hotel Dusk Room 215. Everything that Inkheart tries to do, Hotel Dusk does much better. The story is more compelling, the art is more detailed and stylish, the music is more enjoyable. I probably wouldn't be so hard on this game if I hadn't played Hotel Dusk Room 215. But since I did, I'm forced to give this game my lowest Brendan Fraser rating ever. Six awkward claps out of 40. Yeah, 40. We're doing the famous thing right now. Just like that, we have arrived at our third and final Brendan Fraser DS game, Journey to the Center of the Earth. You know the drill, 2008 movie based on a book starring Brendan Fraser. This movie is a modern retelling of the classic 19th century novel by Jules Verne. Brendan Fraser plays an American volcanologist who, along with his nephew and their guide, become trapped in the Icelandic caverns. Their only way out is to venture deep beneath the Earth's surface where they make some astounding scientific discoveries. Spoiler alert, there's dinosaurs in the middle of the Earth. Yep, the dinosaurs didn't go extinct, they just all went to the middle of the Earth to hang out for a while. The movie performed well at the box office, taking in a total of $244 million worldwide. The Journey to the Center of the Earth DS game was released just before the film's release, with little to no fanfare. Like the Ink Heart game, this one is also a true DS exclusive. I'm actually really surprised this game didn't get the full multi-platform treatment. I mean, really? Not even a Wii game? Are you sure? Okay. Alright, let's venture deep underground with our final Brendan Fraser game. This is Journey to the Center of the Earth. This game starts out with an opening movie. Yeah, a real movie, with 3D graphics. And look who it is, it's Brendan Fraser, and it actually sorta looks like him. There's no voiceover, just text in this ominous music, but so far this game is making a much better first impression than the first two. The group's car breaks down so they head to the volcano on foot. Wait, go back. Yeah, the character models don't load up until a couple of frames in, but I'll let it slide because, hey, at least they actually tried to make an opening movie. Brennan Fraser and crew enter the volcano's caldera and crab walk their way to the first level. The game lets you switch between the three playable characters whenever you want. Each character has unique abilities that help you progress throughout the game. The nephew Sean can cross unstable bridges, Hannah can swing across with a rope, and Brendan Fraser can place bombs to blow up obstructions. This isn't the first time a video game has incorporated this type of mechanic, but it's still a creative feature that keeps the gameplay from quickly becoming stale. One of the first things I noticed when playing this game was the voice acting. Listen to the sound this kid makes when he falls off this ledge. I did not edit that. That is the actual sound he makes in the game. 
That sound is in the DS cartridge. That's the most apathetic scream I have ever heard. And listen to Brendan Fraser when he falls. He sounds like a depressed Goron. Oh, uh, I don't know, Doc. I just don't enjoy eating rocks like I used to. Did they really pay someone to record this? Listen to this kid say, ow. I hear that and I instinctively want to give someone a noogie. You can totally tell that the kicking sound effect is just somebody literally going whoosh into the microphone. But you know, there is a long, rich history of bad voice acting in video games, and sometimes bad voice acting can make a game more charming or memorable. Like one of my all-time favorite game series, Shenmue, has terrible voice acting, but I love it. I would hate if they changed it. I want to ask you something. What? Where are you from? You're not from Guilin, are you? The levels are mostly linear and are in 3D, but they play like they're in 2D. Think of Klonoa. The 3D backgrounds look really good, probably on the same level or even better than the Mummy game. And the characters have a lot more detail. Even though the majority of the game is played underground exploring caves, they were still able to use a lot of different colors to make the levels look more dynamic. I like how the water reflects blue back up to the platforms, or how there are purple shadows cast across the cavern's walls. And check out this hot lava level a bit later in the game. That's pretty good hot lava graphics for a DS game. The controls are okay, probably what you'd expect from a movie tie-in game like this. Also, playing a 3D platformer with the DS's 8 directional D-pad is never an ideal situation, but thankfully the game is pretty forgiving. Whenever you die, you get respawned back at the previous checkpoint. There are a few mini-games you will encounter throughout the game that utilize the bottom touchscreen, like when igniting a bomb fuse, or this puzzle game with a marble, but the main recurring one is this mining mini-game. You use a hammer to first find out where the minerals are, but be careful, if you use the hammer too much, you risk the mineral breaking. You'll have to use progressively smaller tools to chisel away the surrounding rock, and brush it off to finally extract your mineral. This mini-game also acts as a checkpoint, which is pretty convenient considering how many times you fall to your death in this game. The game's strength is definitely the 3D platforming elements, which isn't too surprising considering the developer, Humansoft, also made the DS version of Tomb Raider Legend just two years earlier. As you can see, the gameplay is remarkably similar. Humansoft might not be a household name, but they developed quite a few DS and Game Boy Advance games in the 2000s, and still are developing games to this day. While researching this game, I reached out to the president and CEO of Humansoft, Gabor Kadash, to ask him a few questions about the journey to the center of the Earth game, and he was kind enough to answer them for me. My first question was, why did this game never get a home console release? He said that they had only been given five months to build the game so it could be released in time for the movie's premiere, and that home console games typically take longer compared to handheld games, so THQ went ahead with just a release on the Nintendo DS for this one. I asked if there was any significant changes to the game during development. He said that because of the limited time they had to make the game, no major changes were made, and that they were very happy to get the game done as is in time for the movie's release date. Though it's been 12 years, he says his memories of working on Journey DS are bittersweet because it was the last game they developed for THQ. After that, they worked on a few games for Activision before moving on to the mobile app market. My biggest takeaway from talking to Mr. Kadash was how big of a role the movie's release date had in the development of the games. These movie tie-in games are really only marketable during the movie's theatrical release, and if the game isn't ready to be released then, then it's probably not worth releasing at all. To be honest, I only played through the first four levels of the game. I got a little distracted when I discovered that there's actually a secret level hidden in the game's code. Apparently, the developers made a test level to try out the different items and enemies, and just never took it out. Unfortunately, it's inaccessible while playing on a standard DS system, but if you switch around the folders in the NDS file, you can actually boot it up while playing on an emulator. And that's exactly what I did. To my knowledge, this is the first and only footage of the secret level uploaded to YouTube, and it's a freaking fever dream. It's like a rejected Yes album cover. Say goodbye to those dank caverns cause now we're in outer space and there's icebergs and lizards just zipping around. What's with this floating cube? Is it one of those item blocks from Mario Kart 64? Whoa! 
My favorite thing about this level is definitely these two sharks who have this very repetitive pattern. One of them goes sideways a little bit, and I tried so hard to kick them in their shark faces, and I just couldn't. It's impossible. Take my word, it's impossible. You like platforming? Check out these platforms. I could probably do a whole episode just on this goofy test level. But this video is getting long and I should really wrap things up. If you want to see the whole level, I'll provide a link to the gameplay in the description below. Oh yeah, and I emailed Gabor Karash to ask about the secret level, and he said he had no idea it existed. Alright, final thoughts on this game. Although I wouldn't consider any of the three games a must-play on the DS, I'm comfortable saying that Journey to the Center of the Earth is the best Brendan Fraser game out of the three. And because I'm grading on a curve, I'm giving Journey to the Center of the Earth my highest Brendan Fraser rating ever. Six awkward claps out of six. We did it! We got through this, we played all the Brendan Fraser games on DS. Now no one will ever be able to say that I haven't played every Brendan Fraser game on Nintendo DS. Well, that's gonna do it for this episode of d escapades thank you so much for joining me i hope you enjoyed it check out some of my other videos if wait what's that what's that noise oh come on <laughs>